Okay, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're joining us. Uh, this is our last island Africa. Of the uh, My name is Awasar. I'm Assistant Director for Academic Affairs at Michigan State University's African Studies Center. Ion Africa is our weekly seminar series, and I'm very delighted today to have here with us Dr. Densen Kahiana. Uh, Densen has been uh, at MSU as a Fulbright uh, scholar for the last six uh, months. So he just went back home, and now he's joining us today as our Ion Africa speaker. So. We're very happy to have uh, Dr. Denson Tahiana with, with us. Before we start, a brief introduction. So Denson Sylvester Tahiana teaches literature at Makerere University. He has published creative work in anthologies like The Dance, The Guns to Silence, 2005, and Wandering and Wanderings of Hearts, 2017, and a children's novel, Vera Success, 2009. He is editor of Fire on the Mountain, uh, a creative work on the Obu Hikira in 2018, uh, co-editor, As I Stood Dead Before the World, Creative Writing from Luzera, and Discourse and Identities, Writing and Contemporary Eastern African Peripheral Subjectivities in 2019. His scholarly work has appeared in Journal of African Cultural Studies, Matatu, and Social Dynamics, among others. He is pre president of the Ugandan PEN and a member of the Board of Tr Trustee, Trustees PEN International. He has been a postdoctoral fellow with the American Council of Lundy Society 2015-2016, the Andrew Mullen Postdoctoral Foundation 2018-2019, and as, as I just said, uh, you know, he was a Fulbright Research uh, Scholar here at MSU in 2021. So welcome, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Denson Tahiana. We are very happy to have you. Uh, and yeah, I, I'll pass it to you. All right. Uh, thank you so much. I, I hope you're able to see my screen. Yes, we, we're seeing it. All right. Uh, first of all, I would like to... I would like to thank you for uh, inviting me to present this, uh, this paper. I would like to thank everyone who has made it to the presentation. Uh, here it's uh, 8 p.m. and I'm sorry about my lighting. It is not good enough. Uh, my internet is not good enough either. I'm just praying that uh, the gods can carry me through the presentation without any hiccup. One of the problems we suffer in Africa uh, in most parts of Africa is poor internet connectivity and also power cuts. So I pray that uh, through this one hour, one hour, 20 minutes, uh, nothing will happen. I would like to thank all of you for making time to come and listen to me. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, a Ugandan writer called Dr. Stella Nyanzi. And uh, I've entitled the paper, Shouting a New Nation into Being, Stella Nyanzi's Liberatory Aesthetics in New Roses from My Mouth. The book came out in 2020. And Don't Come in My Mouth. The book came out in 2021. Um, I will begin by, by telling you something small about Stella Nyanzi. Who is Dr. Stella Nyanzi? Uh, I will be, I'll be quite brief. Uh, I would like to say that uh, she's a medical anthropologist, a feminist, and a queer rights uh, activist. Um, and she's a scholar who has done extensive research on African sexualities in Uganda and, and the Gambia. Her areas of uh, research are sex work, um, um, queer studies, and widowhood. She has authored or co-authored more than 50 papers, making her one of the leading Ugandan researchers. Uh, she holds degrees from Makere University and from... Uh, uh, the, and from London. Um, she's a, a former parliamentary candidate. That's very, very important because her second collection is invested a lot in uh, the fact that she ran for the position of member of parliament, the woman member of parliament representing Kampala. She's an avid Facebooker 
And she's a poet with two collections of poems, which I've already mentioned, uh, No Roses From My Mouth 2020, and Don't Come Into My Mouth 2021. You can see that she's quite prolific. Uh, in two years, she has published two collections, and they're quite big collections. Each of them is at least 150 pages. Uh, she's a mother of three uh, children, two of them being twins. In Uganda, this makes her a nalongo, or mother of twins. And it's a very important title because in some traditions in Uganda, a mother of twins can say the unsayable. The position of nalongo gives the mother of twins uh, the license to say the unsayable. And I'm not saying that, uh, uh, this is what, that this is why she really says unsayable, uh, but it's partly, it's partly within that tradition that she also works because she's aware of that tradition. And many times she, she uses the tradition to uh, her advantage. I, I would like to tell you something about the social political context in which uh, Nyanzi writes, because without this, we would not appreciate the weight of the issues that she raises. And uh, it's very hard to, to really tell you something about, uh, about this because it's very complicated. But the short of it all is that uh, the president of Uganda, uh, Yoel Kaguta Museveni, has been in power since 1986. In January next year, next month, he will make 36 years in power. And that, that, that rule is not broken. It has been it has been like that from 1986. Um, uh, one political scientist called Joshua Bongoya says, over time, I'm quoting him. Over time, Museveni has acquired the status of an imperial president, and some government structures have taken on a modus vivendi of a police state. Those are very serious statements coming from uh, a professor of political science. Um, and this professor is writing in 2007. Now you can imagine how much water has passed under the bridge in 14 years. In fact, the situation has worsened so much that some commentators have referred to Uganda as being a shadow state. There is a, a report from Democracy in Africa, a think tank group that came out uh, this year and in that report, the chapter on Uganda is very, very disturbing. Uh, I'm quoting from the chapter on Uganda, uh, how the Ugandan shadow state operates. And, and I'm quoting, sorry, uh, I'm quoting, economic and political power in Uganda is mediated through a network of individuals, most of whom are closely linked to President Yoweri Museveni and his family. Uh, these linkages, uh, these, just a second, one second. Uh, these linkages, sorry about that. I'll just repeat the quotation. Economic and political power in Uganda is mediated through a network of individuals, most of whom are closely linked to President Joel Museveni and his family. These linkages include blood, marriage, kinship, and the shared experience of those who served the liberation struggle known as the Bush War. Uh, the report adds, I, I quote, the image of a monarchy with a strong military influence has been used to describe the near absolute control of, over the state and vital sector of the economy held by Museveni and his extended family. So basically it's a state where, you know, almost every important person in the government is connected to the president either through blood ties or marriage ties or through political patronage that has come over a long period of time. And Adam Seven himself has a large, a large network of patronage. For instance, you'll be surprised that although Uganda is one of the poorest countries in the world, it has a total number of 82 ministers. In fact, the number of ministers is, is more, is larger than the number of consultant doctors. So it has uh, a total number of 82 ministers. It has more than 300 
and 32 resident district commissioners and their assistants. And these report directly to the president. It has uh, more than 20 re resident city commissioners and their assistants. It has more than 141 presidential advisors, uh, senior presidential advisors, presidential advisors, and presidential assistants. And all these people are reporting directly to the office of the president. You can just imagine how entrenched the patronage system is. Um, the Ugandan constitution gives them seven the power to appoint all members to government departments and commissions including the so-called independent electoral commission and most importantly, the judicial service commission. So Museven appoints all the judges to the high court, all the judges to the court of appeal and all the judges to the Supreme Court. You can imagine, you know, he's also the commander in chief of all the armed forces and there are three armed forces, the Uganda People's Defense Forces plus the, the brother or sister unit called the uh, of the veterans, the retired uh, forces, the Uganda police force and the Uganda prison service. All those armed forces uh, uh, have Museveni as their commander in chief. And because of that, he appoints the people who lead these agencies, who head them, you know? Uh, the independence of parliament is in doubt as evidenced by Museveni's direct involvement in at least two constitutional am amendments that he pushed through. The first was the removal of presidential term limits in 2005, and the second one was the removal of the presidential age limit in 2017. Money exchanged hands. It's on record that uh, for the first uh, uh, amendment, the, the removal of presidential term limits, the members of parliament were given about $2,000 each in order for them to vote to lift that, uh, to lift that uh, 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 part of the constitution. Uh, the independence of the judiciary too is in doubt, thanks to the concept of Kada judges that Museven himself coined. So we have judges who are known as Kada judges, and some of them are, are, are known. If there is any case involving the executive, there are some judges uh, that people know can never go against the executive. So uh, it is a very terrible situation, and this situation has worsened with time, uh, with uh, the regime becoming more and more shadowy. And because of this, there have been a lot of resistance to the regime uh, from um, academics, uh, journalists, civil society organizations, and so on. And this resistance has been matched by an equal uh, power of repression and the crushing of dissent. So we have the cracking down on peaceful demonstrations. We have uh, the kidnapping and detaining, and detaining of people uh, in notorious torture chambers, cynically named safe houses. And most importantly, we have the enacting of laws meant to stifle freedom of expression and peaceful assembly. One lawyer called Isaac Semakari, Dr. Selanyanzi's lawyer calls it rule by law and not rule of the law. And of course, in Uganda, some people are above the law. They can break the law at will. You see it uh, uh, during rush hour. They drive on the wrong sides of the, of the lane. They don't care about, uh, about um, uh, traffic lights and so on. Uh, some of the laws that have been enacted specifically to contain dissent uh, the Anti-Terrorism Act 2002, the Access to Information Act 2005, the Regulation of Interception of Communication Act 2010, it was under, then, then also the, the Public Order Act 2013, and so forth. It was under the Computer Misuse Act that Nyanz was convicted on 1st August 2019 for cyber harassing the president. Uh, good enough, successfully appealed the conviction and was acquitted in 2018. Yeah, Stella Nyanzi's liberatory aesthetics. Nyanzi conceives her writing as being geared towards liberating Uganda from the bad governance of President Museveni's rule. She sees words as weapons that she can use to attack the enemies of democratic rule. 
the notion of words serving as weapons uh, brings to mind Mugiwa Thiongo's work, particularly Barrow of a Pen, Resistance Repression in Colonial Kenya, in which he argues in part that because Posimpenes Kenya is a replica of colonial Kenya, the black people in power rule on behalf of their masters uh, who are in capitalist Europe and North America. In her writing, Nyaz uses energetic language that some of her critics consider vulgar or obscene. Uh, let's look at that, vulgar. What's the meaning of the word vulgar? Because that, that's like a major... that has been brought against it and offensive offensive reference to sex or bodily functions, coarse and rude, and characteristic of or belonging to ordinary people. That last bit is very, very important because people have said, how can a professor like Stella Nyanzi talk like that? How can a great researcher like Stella Nyanzi talk like that? How can somebody with a PhD talk like that? So that charge uh, of uh, her not speaking like the professor she is, has been brought against her constantly. And sometimes the Lord excuse the use of polite or civil language and goes instead for the road. For instance, when on 28th January 2017, she called President Museveni a pair of buttocks when he declared at a public meeting in Masindi that he was not anybody's servant. We always knew that presidents are the servants of the people who elect them to office, but Museveni, declared that he was not any... saying that uh, I would like to look at three major aspects of uh, Dr. Stella Nyanzi's uh, uh, Dr. Stella Nyanzi's uh, language. Uh, the first aspect The first aspect is the use of scatological imagery. And I'm going to look at a poem called Enema. The second aspect is the use of grotesque imagery. I'm going to look at a poem called Yoweri. They say it was your birthday yesterday. And the third aspect is the use of the naked body as a weapon of protest and as a form of language, as many theorists like Sylvia Tamale have said, that bodies can be read. And so the naked body is a form of language. And I'll look at a poem uh, entitled Breasts Blazing Like Bazookas. Uh, our, uh, could you confirm that you're hearing me? Yes, we're hearing you very well. Thank you, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, Nyazi theorizes her use of language in at least two poems in the collection, No Roses From My Mouth. And uh, one of the poems, the title poem entitled No Roses from My Mouth. And then the other poem is entitled My Take on My Writing. I asked her to record for me uh, the four poems that I'm going to use in this presentation. And I'd like to thank her for indulging me and actually uh, recording them. And here is Stella Nyans herself reading the title poem, uh, No Roses from My Mouth, which is her own way of theorizing uh, the kind of language she uses. Hi, my name is Stella Nyanzi. I'll be reading No Roses From My Mouth, the title poem for my first anthology of poems that was written in prison. And I thank Danson Kahiana for inviting me to do the reading. No roses from my mouth. There will be no roses falling out of my mouth. Who brings fleeting beauty to war? Instead, there are razor blades and axes, chainsaws, knives, and machetes, daggers, swords, and bayonets. My words cut up our enemies. There will be no honey dripping out of my mouth. Who brings sweetness to war? Instead, there are punches and slaps, hammers, pickaxes, and chisels, Bulldozers, tankers, and undercuts. My words knock out our oppressors. There will be no perfume spreading from my mouth. 
Who cares for aesthetics during war? Instead, there are bazookas and bullets, grenades, torpedoes, and missiles, machine guns, AK-47s, and Kalashnikovs. My words blow up the tyrants. There will be no orgasm coming from my mouth. Who cares about pleasure during war? Instead, there is venom and acid, bombs, landmines, and nukes, poisonous gas and bioweapons. My words destroy our haters. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I'm there. In this poem, uh, as you have heard, Nyanz explains why she does not use the language of civility as captured by the metaphors of roses, honey, perfume, and orgasm. She conceives herself as being at war, and to her, civility will serve her no purpose. What she needs are weapons of combat, um, hard words to cut up her enemies, to knock out uh, her oppressors, and to blow up tyrants, and to destroy haters. But how do how words do this work of blowing up, knocking out, and destroying? I suggest that it's by presenting these rulers who should be uh, as presenting these rulers as hopeless persons who should be ridiculed and insulted because what they do in office is contrary to what is expected of them as leaders. Her argument is that if the leaders expect praise, they should do they should they should serve in a way deserving of praise but since they oppress and plunder since they destroy the countries that they're supposed to preside over then they should expect hard words so to her uh, it does not make sense when uh, a leader is as terrible as she sees himself to be and then people expect her to praise her for her if you're terrible, like M7 is, according to her, then you do not deserve any kind words. You deserve hard words that she equates to uh, guns, AK-47s, and so on. Um, she ridicules the people who accuse her of being vulgar or vile in a short poem entitled, They Must Be Sikistrosynic. I mean, that's a very hard word that... I've never learned how to pronounce, but you, you guys can say it. And she says that these people who expect her to praise the president or to use kind words to the president, they must really ha be having a problem with them. They must be having some kind of uh, uh, bipolar uh, problems because she says they want me to up upbraid the dictator with sweet apples, to rebuke him with sweetened milk and honey, to reproach him with a thick slice of red velvet cake, to revile him with spicy kebabs seasoned with mild cheese, to punish him with a single stout of baileys, to condemn him with strawberry jam spread on fresh bread, to ridicule him with a mug of hot chocolate, to cane him with skewers of muchomo interspersed with vegetables, to condemn him with chocolate chip cookies, to recite him with beautiful love songs, to oust him from power, with praise poetry. And she asks, who does that? I mean, who should expect that kind of thing? Uh, what she's saying here, uh, as I understand her, is that uh, she's in a way forced to use the kind of language uh, that she's using because the people that she's, uh, that she's criticizing do not give her uh, any chance to use better language than, than, than the one she's using. And I call this kind of language she's using a form of shouting. That's why my title is Shouting a Nation into Being. In the sense that it attracts attention to itself in the form of its mode of address, which is deliberately rude. And, and we know that there, there have been uh, great poets, we have had great poets in Uganda, and some of them are even more powerful in their critique of bad uh, governance than Stella Nyanzi, but they have done this using civil language. I can think of two uh, very, very good poets, perhaps the best in the country, 
I can think of Professor Timothy Wangusa, uh, his book, Africa's New Brood, and uh, an Anthem for Africa, and several others. And I can think of uh, Dr. Susan Chiguli, my colleague at Makere, and her two powerful collections, The African Saga and Home Floats in the Distance. They have powerful critiques of bad governance, but they do it in a civil language. And to me, I think that while the poems are very beautiful and very critical of bad governance, the fact that they do their critique, their mode of address is the one of civility, sometimes satire, but satire that is coated with civility. Because of that, in a way, they are not listened to. But because Nyanzi shouts out her message using uh, deliberately rude language, uh, the nation is able to, uh, to listen to her. Every time she speaks, actually she's listened to. Uh, you'll hear a lot of commentary on, on social media, on TV, in the press, and so on. So in a way, she's forced to shout because the situation we, we are in perhaps necessitates that you shout if you are to be, to be heard. And so uh, she's in the quest for listeners. She's in the quest for being listened to. And she's forced to use this kind of language, which happens to be the kind of language that people uh, pay attention to. It's a language that shocks. It shocks us out of our comfort zones, if you like. When, for example, she declares Museveni a pair of uh, of buttocks. Um, uh, of course, uh, there have been cri critiques that uh, her writing is not as good. I mean, if you compare it to the writing of the two poets I have mentioned, like uh, Professor Timothy Wangusa and Professor Susan Cheguli, uh, they are more sophisticated in their use of, of uh, language and idiom than she is but she does not care about that. She has said that what matters is that her, her writing has, has achieved the purpose for which it was meant. And what is this purpose? This little poem gives us an idea of that purpose. She says, my writing may be cheap, but it's rather effective. My poetry may be tasteless, but it's shaking the nation. My Facebook posts may be tacky, but they grab the balls of the tyranny. And I'm beyond highlighting those. My paragraphs may be repulsive, but they sting the queen bee. My stanzas may be irreverent, but they poked the leopard's anus. One time President Seven referred to him, referred to people who tried to challenge him as those poking the leopard's anus. So this is allusion. My language may be dirty, but to expose the dictatorship. She's quite aware that her language may be dirty, but what matters to her is that it achieved its purpose of exposing the different uh, guises and the different tactics of the dictatorship in, in power. Um, my, my pen never stops writing. I write myself to, to freedom. I write myself to, uh, to freedom. That's, that's a little poem. Now I'm going to look at uh, one of the of the of the modes of the of the language features of, of, of her poem, and this is the use of scatological imagery. According to Chris Bold, Boldick, scatology refers to the study of excrement, for instance, in medicine or paleontology. In the literary sense, it means repeated reference. Repeated reference to excrement and related matters, as in the coarse humor of Rabelais or Jonathan Swift, whose works have passages of eschatological nature. Two of the matters related feces are urine and fat. There are at least three poems in No Roses, uh, where Stella Nyanzi uses this kind of imagery, and these are Enema. Peace and shit at Makere and your aesthetic uh, standards. In this presentation, I would like to focus on the poem Enema. Hi, I'll be reading uh, 
three poems for Danson Kahiana from um, my two books. The first is from my book called No Roses from My Mouth, and it's entitled Enema. The dictator is a big, fat, old poop enlarged in the bowels of Uganda. In pain, the masses live and stoop. 33 years of constipation. We shall no longer use a tender scoop, for we are the enema. The dictator is a big malignant tumor, spreading his cancer all over Uganda. The elite lay besieged and in a stupor. The masses yield too weakened by hunger. But we refuse to surrender, for we are the surgeon's blade. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stella. I would like to thank Stella for that uh, wonderful reading. Um, I'm really very happy to share the platform with her through the agency of her reading. Uh, I would like to very briefly talk about uh, at least seven roles. We can even get 10 or 15 the roles that that kind of imagery uh, uh, play in the, in the poem. Uh, because of time, I'm seeing it's already uh, 21 minutes to at one, I will try to be very quick. So the imagery is a direct response to the shocking abuse of power by President Museveni. It's as if the abuse of power is so shocking that Nyaz does not have any sanitized language with which to describe it. You know, this brings to mind the Swahili proverb, Dawa ya moto ni moto. That is, uh, fire's medicine is fire. Or oh, the notion that you fight fire with, with fire. And because he, she's facing a vulgar regime, uh, she feels that the use of a vulgar language is the most fitting language for that. But secondly, uh, the use of uh, that kind of imagery disrupts the silence surrounding excessive eating, which in the poet's mind is captured by constipation. For as Joshua D. S. T. has observed, shit in postcolonial writing serves as a symbol of excessive consumption. So by looking at Museveni as shit, uh, Nyanzi is also uh, highlighting the fact that the regime survives on too much eating in the form of corruption and other uh, shady uh, deals. But the use of uh, that kind of imagery that has to do with shit also demystifies President Museveni as flesh and blood not as a God who should be feared uh, or, or revered. For if he can be called shit, then for sure, the ordinary mortal whose attempt at being president for life should be resisted. The imagery also allows Nyanzi to experiment with other grotesque images, for instance, calling President Museveni a drenched sanitary pad in a poem that bears this title uh, in the collection, No Roses, for when Museveni is imagined as fecal matter, his power is in a way broken, thereby allowing Nyaz to call him anything else she feels uh, appropriate. Uh, besides, the imagery highlights the role that women need to play in liberating Uganda from Museveni's stronghold on power. Since in many communities, enemas are usually administered by, I quote, Solicitors, mothers, as a hygienic means of loosening impacted bowels, relieving flatness, and instigating the proper flow of excrement. I think this is a very important point. Enema, enemas are usually administered by women. And I think this poem highlights the, the role that women are playing in the fight ag against bad uh, leadership. It also highlights the, 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 the limits of power, in my view. Yeah, in the sense that while President Seven might have all the guns and all the combat helicopters that he needs and all the spies and so on, while he might have all the tear gas and so on, all these could not stop uh, this woman calling her a piece of shit. And I think this is in line with what Michel Foucault observes, that where there is power, there is resistance, and that power is limited. Power is never uh, absolute. 
Uh, uh, it also locates no roses from my mouth in a rich tradition of African letters that use the same technique. And uh, I can just have uh, two books that are coming to my mind. The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born, which is a very beautiful book. Uh, it came out in 1968. And uh, Coffee Owners, This Art, My Brother, which came out in 1971. Okay, um, that's one. One aspect of her language, the use of scatological imagery. I'm going to the second aspect, which is the use of grotesque imagery. And here we are looking at uh, what she called the birthday poem that she, she composed uh, from seven. And remember that this poem is coming at a time when President Museveni has amended the constitution to allow him to allow him to, to run for office even when he's beyond 75, which is what the, the, the previous constitution had, uh, had provided for. So this poem is coming with a lot of anger that this man has practically declared himself a life president in the sense that even the constitutional safeguard that we are looking at for, for relief, that we are looking at that would stop him from running for president again, has been assaulted. And so she's writing this poem, uh, the so-called birthday poem, with that anger and angst that um, there is no more, there's, no, there's nothing more to stop him Seveni from becoming a life president. And uh, as Harold Bloom observes, uh, the grotesque image usually co uh, comes with astonishment, you know, and some form of uh, distaste. And I think we shall see both uh, uh, both uh, uh, things in in uh, the poem. Actually, it's a very disturbing poem, and I should uh, maybe tell you to uh, brace yourselves for the kind of very difficult imagery that you're going to listen to. Hi, glad to read for Professor Danson Kahiana from my second anthology of poems entitled Don't Come In My Mouth. And I'll be reading the poem that um, got me a prison sentence of 18 months. I served 15 months in maximum security prison and then I was acquitted. The title is You Worry, They Say It Was Your Birthday Yesterday. You worry, they say it was your birthday yesterday. How bitterly sad a day. I wish the smelly and itchy cream-colored candida festering in Esiteri's cant had suffocated you to death during birth. Suffocated you just like you are suffocating us with oppression, suppression, and repression. You worry, they say it was your birthday yesterday. How painfully ugly a day. I wish the lice-filled bush of dirty pubic hair overgrown all over Esoteri's unwashed choo-choo had strangled you at birth, strangled you just like the long tentacles of corruption you sowed and watered into our bleeding economy. You worry, they said it was your birthday yesterday. How nauseatingly disgusting a day. I wish the acidic pass flooding Esiteri's cast vaginal canal had burnt up your unborn fetus, burnt you up as badly as you have corroded all morality and professionalism out of our public institutions in Uganda. You worry, they say it was your birthday yesterday. How horrifically cancerous a day. I wish the infectious dirty brown discharge Flooding Esiteri's loose pussy had drowned you to death. Drowned you as vilely as you have sunk and murdered the dreams and aspirations of millions of youth who languish in the deep sea of massive unemployment and underemployment in Uganda. You worry, they say it was your birthday yesterday. How traumatically wasted a day. I wish the poisonous uterus sitting just above the Citeri's dry clitoris had prematurely miscarried a thing to be cast upon a manure pit. Prematurely miscarried you just like you prematurely aborted any semblance of democracy, good governance, and rule of law. 
your worry. They say it was your birthday yesterday. How morbidly grave a day. I wish that Esoteri's cast genitals had pushed out a monstrously greenish, bluish still birth. You should have died at birth, you dirty delinquent dictator. You should have died in birth, Yorika Guta Museveni. <laughs> if you want to beat me for my heartfelt birthday poem, come and find me at my home. Ask the Boda Boda men to direct you to Mama Stella's house with a red gate. I refuse to be gagged. Thank you. And thank you, Danson, for the opportunity to read my poetry with your audience. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you, Stella, for reading that. Uh, as we can see in this poem, uh, she chooses a no holds barred approach. Um, she wishes that different parts of Esteri's, that is um, Seveni's mother, uh, that different parts of her reproductive system should have done harm to him before he was born or as he was being born so that he does not see the light of day. And if he had died at birth, then Uganda would have been saved the tragedy that uh, uh, is now in because of Museveni. Well, the diction that carries her wishes, the reader, uh, is loaded with insults and curses bringing to mind Donna Shai's observation that, I quote, while a curse expresses a wish that evil may befall a certain person, the insult attributes to a person a vile adjective with the intention of lowering the dignity of the person addressed. Actually, this is what Nyaz is doing. Uh, she wants to lower the dignity of Museveni by uh, depicting him as a foul thing. Um, the, the, the problem is actually the, 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 the reference to Seveni's mother, because this mother is innocent. This mother has not committed any crime by giving birth to Seveni. Uh, what Seveni has become is not necessarily because of uh, Esteri's mother. And I think what, what is disturbing in this poem is the part that talks about Esteri's mother and her reproductive uh, organ. And even the suggestion that uh, uh, she's loose, uh, which is why she has given a birth to such a person like Museveni. The suggestion that uh, uh, something must have been pathological about the mother. That's why she gave birth to such uh, a monstrous uh, being like President Museveni. I think we can see that uh, in this poem, Nyanzi has gone a little further than she had done in the previous uh, poem. And I attribute this to the fact that the frustration with the regime is growing, is growing, and Nyanzi would like to see Museveni ousted from power. But we can do it militarily, but we cannot do it through public organizing. She does it in, uh, in form of, uh, of a poem. Uh, one could say that, uh, uh, seen from this perspective, the poem uh, actually shows Nyanzi becoming losing hope that sooner or later, Museveni will be gone. Of course, one can argue the opposite, that before Museveni is killed uh, physically or is removed from office physically, you have to remove him uh, in the form of a poem by declaring him as a monstrous thing, uh, not worth living, but rather a thing that should be cast on the rubbish heap or in the incinerator at the hospital because um, uh, it is not worth uh, 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 the life that it has. I, I find this very, very <laughs> disturbing. Actually, I'm a big supporter of Nyanzi, Nyanzi work, but this poem, I really find it very, very uh, disturbing. And I think my sympathies are with uh, Museveni's mother, because as I have uh, said, the way she depicts her and her reproductive system is very problematic. And it's a form of disrespect to her, even given the fact that she's departed, she's not here with us, she cannot answer back. And, and therefore, really she's fighting with somebody who is not there to fight back. 
but we can uh, the, the the major point is that in terms of effectiveness of her imagery of her hyper her hyperbole of her uh, use of language i mean it is tying with what i have said before the frustration with the regime and the desire to see this regime change uh, but the, but the longer the regime stays in power the worse it gets and of course the more angry or the angrier that um, Nyanzi, uh, Nyanzi gets, which can explain uh, the fact that uh, she wrote this kind of poem. And this is the poem that got her arrested and imprisoned. This is the poem that got her convicted, uh, but thanks to her tenacity, she was able to fight the conviction and she was acquitted uh, a few weeks to her leaving uh, prison. Because of time, I will just move on. I'll go to the, the final uh, poem I would like to I would like to look at, and and that is uh, entitled "Breasts Blazing Like Bazookas," and I find it one of my best uh, poems in the collection. Um, uh, and in this poem, Nyanzi speaks with the language of her naked body as a weapon of protest to call for a better governed Uganda. And we should remember uh, what Sylvia Tamale and other theorists have told us, that bodies are texts that are readable. Um, and there are at least two instances when uh, Selanyans has uh, spoken with her naked body. The first was on 18th April 2016, when she stripped to protest the closure of her office at the Macquarie Institute of Social Research. I think everybody in the world heard about it. And then this very po particular poem, uh, she stripped on 2nd of August when she was taken to the male prison to be sentenced via video link instead of being taken to a courtroom. And she felt that that was a violation of her rights. Breasts blazing like bazookas. This is a poem from my book entitled No Roses from My Mouth that I wrote in prison. Not one to give in without a fight, I launched my stealth operation when they least expected me. For they thought they had me cornered, they thought they had beaten me down, they thought I was a horse broken in, they undermined my resilience, they underestimated my tenacity. I bounced back harder than a tennis ball abusing my constitutional right to be produced in court for my sentence. They forced me into a video audio recording room with teleconferencing computers feeding into and out of the courtroom. Rather than take me to Buganda Road Chief Magistrate's court, they drove me to the all male maximum security prison. They took me to Upper Luzira prison with neither my consent nor my willingness with neither my consent nor my willingness. Isolated from those who love and defend me, they hoped to intimidate me into compliance. Escorted by four powerful female prison staff and surrounded by 12 male prison staff, I could have caved in and collapsed, given up in defeat, surrendered the struggle with both hands up. I could have withered like a flower coward in shameful cowardice but i refused defeat i thought of my ancestors and refused defeat i thought of my children and refused defeat i raised both my middle fingers and shot rapid slurs at the justice system i improvised an impromptu oration exposing the fucked up judicial system and poetically fucking the failed court system, I pulled up my kitenge blouse. I hoisted up my power bra, let loose my big brown breasts and shot down my enemies with rapid bullets from my nipples. Pua, 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 pua. My breasts were blazing bazookas, shooting down the injustices of justice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stella. Um, and I think Stella is with us. Um, I have seen a comment from her. I think she's with us. Because of time, I will not go through this slide and, and this slide. 
I'll, I will go to that one. Uh, Stella says that um, uh, by hoisting up her power bra and exposing her breasts, she calls it a form of improvised oration. And that's the beauty with Stella, that uh, she theorizes her own writing. Actually, I'm working on a paper of the poet other theorist. I'm, I'm working on a paper on, uh, on Stella Nyans again, uh, looking at her as a theorist of her own work. As she's writing the poems, she's also doing the work of, of theorizing uh, the language she uses, the tactics she uses, and so on. And that quotation, we have heard it uh, from her. Um, I would like to suggest that the language of weapons is President Museveni's love language. If we are to allude to that uh, beautiful book, Gary Chapman's The Five Love Languages, uh, System Seven is a renowned warlord and a military hero. So Nyazi has chosen to use military register uh, that M7 is bound to understand well. Some people have suggested that uh, uh, naked protests are always already last resorts for the subjects who perform them as captured by the title of a future documentary entitled Naked, the, the Naked Option, the Last Resort. And there are many instances when indeed it's the last resort. And in this poem, uh, it was indeed a last resort. She was escorted by, by so many prison officers and she thought she was going to be produced in, uh, in, in uh, the court, the public court that she knows, only to be taken to the men's uh, male prison. So, um, uh, Maminata Diabate has called this kind of writing uh, or action naked agency. This kind of naked protest, she has called it naked, naked agency in the sense that um, the person protesting uh, performs a, a confrontational exhibition of her body in public as a result of her lack of options. And therefore, uh, this signals vulnerability. But this vulnerability is creatively recovered uh, with the body becoming a weapon to articulate the dissatisfaction that is going on around the protester. And in this case, around the decision of the government and its agencies not to take Stella Nyanzi to a court that she was expecting to be taken to, but um, uh, to the male prison where she's to be sentenced via video link. Um, well, of course, the idea was to isolate her, isolate her from her, her supporters who usually gather, gathered around courts to give her moral support. The idea also was to isolate her from the media who report what is going on, thereby keeping her circulating in the public imagination. And of course, the idea was to break her, 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 her courage by saying, well, we can do what we want to do. And by speaking with the language of her breasts, the regime was shocked into um, embarrassment. Uh, in fact, the comment, the commentaries uh, about that uh, protest, uh, a lot of people say, well, what she did was great because that was the only way she was going to speak uh, to articulate uh, her issues. Others, of course, always say, oh, that's an evil woman. Why does she show people her breasts and so on? And we expect that kind of reaction from uh, the patriarchal societies, which look at women's bodies as sacred and therefore, um, uh, showing showing the breasts as a form of protest becomes a scandal. Okay, I'd like to conclude and, I, and I'd like to apologize for taking so long. I think it's because of the internet uh, disruptions that I had that um, uh, Nyazi's form of writing is a form of shouting in order to be heard. Uh, people say she's vulgar and so on. Well, we need to look beyond the vulgarity and see what she's able to achieve with that mode of address that she has, uh, that she has chosen. Um, and in a way she's challenging the leaders that if, they, if, if she must write uh, poems praising them, then they should work hard 
so that they are worthy of praise. Otherwise, if they don't do that, they will only meet with ridicule from her pen. And um, uh, this, in this way, she's really, she's really hoping that uh, people will listen to her and will run their affairs better so that they don't become uh, subjects of her poetry. And in this way, she's writing for change that these people will be ashamed to do better things or they will fear to be ridiculed. And through that fear, they will avoid the path of uh, tyranny, the path of plunder, the path of misrule. Uh, her work has inspired very many poets. One of them is called uh, Daphne Rinda, and the other one is called Ashana Ashava. I was supposed to play uh, her poem where she, where, where she says she would like to be present. If you have questions, you can start typing them in the Q&A. You will also be able to ask it live. while we wait for Denson. So Dr. Stella Nganze, if you want to talk, I think we would love to hear from you. It's amazing. Uh, I think from the comment from the chat, people enjoyed very much the, the presentation. Uh, I was wondering if I can maybe let you... Denson, are you there? Hi, Awa. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Right. So I don't know how to turn my video on, video onto the webinar, but I'll just, as Danson comes on, I want to thank, um, thank you very much for the platform. I was invited to read some poems for Danson, and I didn't realize he was actually going to do a fully fledged pepper uh, on my work. Um, I, I don't know if I'm honored. I think I am honored that um, an academic who has studied literature and specializes in, you know, critical analysis um, of, of poetic works has devoted some time to my writing. And I want to thank uh, Danson very much for investing time. One of the things he said opened my eyes to what I was doing with my poetry. I think that my, my poems have been criminalized so many times in Uganda. I have been charged at least twice, prosecuted twice, imprisoned twice, convicted once and sentenced once because of, of my poetic writings. Um, and so it is very affirming when a literary scholar um, devote some time to studying what I write because in my country I think the vast majority of um, scholars in the literature departments and universities have barred their students from even doing analysis of my work because it is called uh, some scribbling, some mutterings of a mad woman, but I want to appreciate um, the small body of literature scholars in Uganda who, like Danson, are interpreting my writing um, for, for audiences and to interpret my poems for academics is, 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 is very affirming. And I want to thank him for that. Uh, comparing me to great poets like Professor Timothy Wangusa and Dr. Susan Cheguli. Oh God, <laughs> like, 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 you know, it's, I'm, I'm very flattered by that. And maybe just one thing that I would uh, say was 
that a lot of what I have written has been interpreted many ways. I think that um, the misinterpretation is welcome, the translation is welcome, the mistranslation is welcome, but often the mistranslation happens when people are lazy. And uh, the critique around uh, many feminists have criticized me for uh, doing what uh, Danson Kahiana has pointed out in his presentation that I uh, used the dead body of Yoweri Museveni's mother in perhaps my most important work, the birthday poem that got me arrested and convicted. I talk about the vagina of Esiteri and the clitoris and her birth canal and her birthing processes. But what I want to do is to invite people like da Danson who are working with my poetry to, to go a little further. What if Esiteri was a metaphor and not the mother, the dead mother of Yoweri Museveni? What if I use her literally as a, a device to ask about the material and historic conditions that create dictators. How are dictators born? What sort of womb are they birthed in? What, what conditions carry them and nurture them for nine months of pregnancy? What vaginal canals produce them into the world? What breasts nurture them? How are dictators made and created? What if Esiteri is not referring to the dead, rotting corpse of a dictator, but is a literary device that demands interpretation? So I want to invite um, Danson and others to perhaps sometimes look a little deeper at the sort of, especially feminist metaphors that I use, but I thank him very much for the work he's done and I celebrate your... Um, association for allowing my poetry to feature because many others will not allow my poetry to even be discussed or debated. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. We are very honored to have you with us and to take the time to elaborate and bring about those collaboration. Denson, are you here yet? No? Okay, so uh, I think there is one question that since Denzel is not here, maybe you can help us a little bit understand better. Uh, Isaac Kalumba uh, has a question asking uh, uh, how effective do you think your poetry uh, is in affecting change in Uganda? Like, what, what do you think the, the effect has been? I, you alluded to that a little bit by talking about your critics, but I'm, I'm sure there are some, some other responses to your poetry. Right, so um, I think for me that many people who judge my work and say it is not effective are people who expect that I was expecting Yoweri Museveni to leave State House after reading my poetry, uh -uh. that is not the effect I'm trying to achieve. Many times I'm writing to power holders, oppressors, people who abuse state power and have deaf ears. They don't listen to polite talk anymore. They don't listen to the public media if the public media is going to criticize them. They only allow praise singers to, to have license and permission to speak on public media fora. And so what I did, or what I do with my poetry, what I'm trying to achieve is to get oppressive, repressive, militant, authoritarian dictators such as Museveni and his family and his cohort of psychophants in the regime government to listen, to listen for one minute Listen to the pain and disgruntlement and plight of Ugandans such as myself, of poor women, of, of, of youth who are unemployed, of women looking for their abducted children in prisons that are not marked. And so in terms of effect, if it is to get an audience, we know from my arrests and imprisonment and the charges against me in court that Museveni has heard 
the vulgarity of my poetry. We can't say he's not heard it. He's heard it, he's offended, he's responded. And so it's very effective in terms of getting audience. Which audience regime critics who are polite do not get anymore? And so how effective is my poetry in creating change? I think one of the changes it has created is to invite younger poets, younger writers, younger stand-up comedians to touch the hem of power using similar tools. I think that in terms of effective change, maybe not so much has changed among the lives of Ugandans, but among the critics of government, people know they can now ridicule and mock and insult and shame the dictator in power. And that is powerful, effective change. It is as if I give permission to others to use whatever weapons they can, whatever nonviolent weapons they can. If a mere poem can upset a man with a million guns, keep writing the poems. And so I think rather than think that I have put food on the tables of poor people or stopped corruption or anything like that, what my poem has affected brilliantly is to encourage other writers to write powerfully, ridiculously, vulgarly, to write and experiment with alternative forms of communicating truth to power. Um, and for me, that is good enough. That is very wonderful. Uh, uh, Donson is back, but I think we have a question that's addressed to you directly, if you can answer it. Uh, Peter Pernal has a question asking, is there any collaboration by, with writers that are in the same situation, for instance, in countries like Zimbabwe? Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I'm so embarrassed that uh, there was a power cut. Remember how I had told you that it might happen? It's happening more and more often. I think we are using more money to buy more guns. I think you're aware that Uganda has launched an assault on the allied democratic forces rebels in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And you may also be aware that Uganda is constructing some roads in the, in the, in the Democratic Republic of Congo as well. About the collaboration between and among poets, uh, well, Museveni's, one of Museveni's modes of operation is divide and rule. So not, not very many people have uh, appreciated uh, Dr. Stella Nyanzi's way of writing. A lot of people say, uh, what kind of poetry is that? In fact, a lot of people uh, dismiss Dr. Stella even before they read her work. So when I, when I give them a copy of No Roses, I have, a, I have a PDF copy. They're like, wow, this is brilliant writing. This is uh, bold writing. This is what we need and so on. So among the writers, uh, there, there's a lot. Uh, Sela Nyanzi has become um, a tower of inspiration for the young writers. And many of them uh, actually... Uh, taking on her mode of address. There's a young writer called Kagai Mutanga, and he has a book called Yellow Pupu Poems. Uh, the, the political color of NRM of Museveni's party is yellow. And that book is called Yellow Pupu Poems. You can really see echoes between her work and Stella Nyanzi. We have a young writer called Anna Ashana, who was my student at Makere University. In fact, she sent me her recording of her poem. I was supposed to play it, but it was too large. I was not able to upload the video. And she has a poem called, I would like to be President of Seven East Side Chick. And when you read that poem, it has the echo of one of uh, uh, Dr. Sela Nyanzi's most celebrated Facebook posts when she said, I would like to make love to the president. Uh, there's another one called Daphne Arinda, who really has written a lot of work that echoes Dr. Stella Nyanzi. So the collaborations might not be direct, but they are there. I should mention that Dr. Stella Nyanzi is a, is a what? Is a live wire. So not many people want to be seen with her directly, except those who are into uh, political activism. She's a, a live wire because the state is scared of her work. 
and the state, of course, is roaming around saying who is collaborating with Dr. Sela Nyanzi and so on. So I think there are a lot of people who are taking on her mode of address. The actual collaborations between and among poets, I don't know how much of that is happening. I was away for nine months, but I know that in the next two, three years, we shall have a lot of what one professor calls telescapes. <laughs> a professor from uh, uh, the University of California at Fullerton uh, said, good luck with your, your telescapes, you know? Um, there's a lot that is going on uh, with Stella Nyanzi serving as an inspiration to many of us. Personally, I do write poetry. I've never used uh, Stella Nyanzi's mode of address, but recently I wrote a poem where I asked Seven to shut up. And I attribute that courage to Stella Nyanzi. If we can call Museveni a piece of shit, what about if I told Museveni to shut up? Would I be in too much trouble? So I think uh, sooner or later, we shall have research on what Dr. Stella's writing is, how it is galvanizing the efforts of using art for regime change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question. Uh, by Umar Cham. Uh, thank you, Denson, for the exposition of a committed poet in a difficult country. My question, what would this tell us poetry away from Museveni's presidency? I, I, I didn't hear that question. He, he's asking what is uh, uh, Stella's poetry away of Museveni's presidency? Uh, how they, how they, I'm, I'm missing the, I'm missing the word. Of network. You know, as, as a committed poet, well, like let's say uh, mm. in 50 years, hopefully, if the dictator is gone, how is uh, uh, Stella's poetry? How will it uh, be viewed or will it stand the, the oh. time? In another word, I think. Oh, damn. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, my brother from Senegal. Well, um, that's a very good question. And Stella, Stella is online. <laughs> Stella, Stella, I, I would love to pass that to Stella. But uh, uh, the poems, a lot of poems are very, very good. And I think they will stand the test of time. Uh, I mean, we still read about Rabelais and, uh, and his uh, aesthetics, uh, his use of scatology to make fun of uh, the Middle Ages, the medieval, the medieval age. So I think because the poems are good, even when they use the mode of address of vulgarity, I think um, uh, uh, mo most of the poems will stand the taste of, of time. Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm going to send uh, my brother, I'm going to send my brother a copy of the poems. And when he reads them, he'll realize that a lot of them are very good. There will be others which are which are perhaps too too shocking, like um, Seveni's birthday poem. That one is quite specific to Seveni. That will die away. But other poems like Enema, other poems like No Roses from My Mouth, other poems, several other poems. Stella, do you want to take it from there? Yes, if 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 I may, for a minute, as Danson returns. I mean, I think the way I understood uh, Cham's question is, if Museveni was not around, right today, for example, what would my poetry be like? And I want to answer it three ways. One, I have written so many other poems that don't focus on Museveni. When I was in prison, I wrote about prison women and I wrote about my children and missing them. And I write about motherhood. I write about poverty. I write about the education system. I write about so many other things. So whether or not Museveni lived, I think I would still be writing about the 
everyday realities we live as Ugandans living in whatever context, whatever presidential uh, regime I'd be living in. The second way of looking at it is that actually Yoweri Museveni has produced some of the conditions of, of oppression and repression and silencing and joblessness that I go through every day. Although I have a PhD, no university will employ me in Uganda, for example. I was slapped with a travel ban. I couldn't leave my country until I sued the government. I was, the government wanted to subject me to involuntary mental examination because of what I write about the president. And so many of the everyday conditions of suffering and plight and oppression that I go through have been produced particularly because of Yoweri Museveni. However, I don't think he produces them as an individual. I think that my work is very relevant to other people living in dictatorships all over the world. It may not be Yoweri Museveni, it may be the next dictator in the next uh, repressed country, the next militant country. And so my poetry, focusing around the conditions of dictatorship, become very relevant in those contexts that are similar to Uganda's contexts. And the third way of looking at the question is, um, I hope that my work will stand the taste of time, if not to be understood as works of beauty, to be understood as works of resistance. What is resistance poetry like? How does one use poetry not to create beauty, but as a weapon? So for people looking for uh, innovative, creative ways of using the arts to speak directly towards power, I think that many of my poems will be relevant for a long time. But that's my understanding that whether or not Museveni is here, how does my poetry work? Although I think that some of the pain that is recorded and some of the anger that inspires me comes directly from living under dictatorship that is spearheaded by Yuri Museveni. Wonderful. Uh, thank so yeah, and thank you, Stella. I think people should read the work because most of them, they, they, as I said, they dismiss Stella without reading the work. So when they read the work, really, they will discover that um, it's very good, and it will speak to uh, a lot of uh, circumstances and regimes. Because even when Seven is dead, there will be other dictators in other parts of the world. Wonderful. Any questions or comments? We have four more minutes. Maybe as we wait for any comment or question, I'd like to apologize for the power cut, several power cuts and uh, the internet connectivity. I think this speaks to some of the issues that we work in in Uganda. And, uh, and this is not by accident. I think the resources that would have been used to improve the power supply and the internet connectivity are being used to, to entrench the regime in power. So I think uh, you have experienced in some way what we experience every day. And secondly, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Stella Nyanzi for making it to, uh, to the seminar and for uh, speaking about her experience and talking about, about her poetry. Um, she's really one of the greatest voices we have. She has sacrificed herself, she has sacrificed her comfort, she has sacrificed her, her job, she has sacrificed her family, she has sacrificed her country. Sooner or later, she'll be out of Uganda because she's not safe in Uganda. I think it takes a lot of love for the nation, love for humanity, love for fellow citizens for somebody to do that. And I'd like to thank my colleagues who made it to, uh, to the seminar. I see Dr. Susan Chigli, I see Dr. Okot Benge, I see Dr. Yves Navulia, and perhaps the others I've not seen. I'd like to thank them so much for coming. And I'd like to thank the African Studies Center for inviting me to give this seminar. My apologies for the poor connectivity and for the power cut. I'm so sorry about that. 
Thank you so much, Denton, for a great uh, presentation. And really also thank you to Dr. Stella. Uh, Denton says your last nail so beautifully. I am afraid I won't be able to pronounce it. That's why I'm just using your also very beautiful first name. So I'm calling you Dr. Stella. I hope that's fine. Thank you so very much. I, I really appreciate your, your participation, your insight. And uh, I think Denson has given us the, the desire and to, to go and read your poetry. I think for most of us, uh, we never heard about it, but we, we are eager to go and, and read, read about it. Uh, so thank you everybody for coming. I think this was a very beautiful, powerful uh, presentation. And it was our last seminar of the semester. So thank you for attending it. And we'll see you next year, inshallah, for another Eye in Africa. Thank you, everybody, and bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.